to answer any questions you may have or uh, help with any needs that you may have. So let us uh, begin our worship this morning as we, uh, let's see, what's first on our list? Oh, we have a hymn. So if you are able, let's stand and sing. If you're not able to stand, that's okay. Good morning, you all. I'm Pastor Willie Lash from that Grace Church in Britain, and that's the folks eight miles west. You've heard of us out there in Lanawee County. Yeah. There are people here from Ida from the east, and Petersburg from the south, and Azalea from the north, and we're just in the middle. What a great collection of folks today. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. For me, this is a special experience because I know Jesus really expressed his love for us when we all get together and love is one. So there's a lot to share this morning. Experience, let's just get right to it. Let's pray. God Almighty, creator of heavens and earth, today by the power of your spirit, we unite in prayer. We unite with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We unite with sisters and brothers from all Christian churches and denominations. We unite with all who are joined by the Holy Spirit of God. We unite with followers from every church and congregation. We unite with God's sons and daughters from every creed and culture. Our loving God, you call us to hospitality, to give as generously to others as you have given to us. Loving God, you call us to give you glory in the compassion we show to one another, to love without judgment of ourselves or of others. We gather as one body, seeking to walk in the way you have set for us. We gather as one body to worship the one who is love. And as we gather as one church, your church, Jesus, we ask that we sense this Christian unity that we all need so that we can go forth and share that good news of Jesus Christ to all that we come in contact with. And Lord, as you are among us today, I know you are really smiling, happy that your children are worshiping together. 
I can feel that smile, Jesus, that I, I look amongst all God's children right here gathered today. Thank you, creator, sustainer, and redeemer. And all God's children say, Amen. It's my pleasure to welcome Karen up for our call to worship. Thanks, Pastor Willie. Don't you love his enthusiasm? <laughs> if you will please stand and join me in the responsive call to worship. We come together today in Christian love. Let us worship together in Christian love. We come together from different denominations and faiths to sing praises to our loving God. Let us sing praises together in Christian love. We come together from different backgrounds and circumstances to thank our loving God for his many blessings. We are one church together in Christian love. And now you may be seated in Pastor Kelly. Let us pray. God of all people, open our hearts to understanding other faith traditions. We are all made in your image and seek to know and follow your ways, to praise you, and to be instruments of your holy presence. We thank you for the peoples and traditions you have gathered here today. May we respect those who follow a different faith tradition than us. Open our hearts and minds and guide us in the way of holy friendships that we may learn to better love you, one another, and ourselves. May we seek to know the truth of your word and find common ground among our faith traditions and recognize that we share a common humanity. Give wisdom, creativity, and perseverance to all who work for unity, peace, and the freedom of all people. Grant us inquiring minds, searching hearts, and curious spirits that we might deepen our own faith by learning of your ways. Look with compassion, O Lord, on the whole human family, whom you have made in your image and according to your likeness, and unite us in bonds of love. Help us to be people of compassion and understanding, creating a path to a peaceful coexistence among all people. Let us take a moment of silent prayer as we turn our hearts and minds towards God this morning. Good morning. I am Pastor Janice from St. John here in Dundee. And I would like us to join together in confessing our faith using the words of the Ecumenical Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Reverend Tracy and Bob Hoffman to provide us with a special music offering.
will soon be solved right simple the sun forbid to shine and will my fields wash and soon be soft the snow the sun forbid to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be Boy, what a way to follow. <laughs> In our Psalm of 103, we will read verses 10 to 14. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great in his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers what we are dust. Here ends the reading. Good morning. My name is Randy Lee. I am at Azalea in London, and uh, also I come from St. Paul's. And this is the time to bless the offerings that you so graciously put in the basket when you, when you came in. If you'll pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this awesome chance to be givers in this world, not just takers. It is so easy to take and so hard to give. And for some of us, it is a, a burden to return back. And yet, it is something we do knowing that you will use these gifts that you have offered us, these gifts that you have given us to do your work in missions, in foreign countries, and here. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you for the wonderful gifts that you've given us. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Ken Papanagan. I'm the pastor of the Dundee Community Church of the Nazarene. Most often we're just call ourselves the Dundee Community Church. So today I get to tell the story that I love so much to tell. So I get to read you the Gospels. We're going to start with John 13, starting in verse 31. Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Children, I am with you for a little while longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I am telling you where I am going, you cannot come. 
I give you a new commandment, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Let me go back to Mark. Mark wrote, Verse 12, 28 through 34. One of the scribes approached. When he had heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe answered and said to him, You are right, teacher. You have correctly said that he is one. And there is no one except him. And to love him with all of your heart and with all of your understanding and with all of your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is far more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him any longer. So ends our gospel message today. Praise be to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we get to sing a song. I know. And it's called, I Love to Tell the Story. Such a fitting one after we hear the gospel message.
it's my pleasure to be back with you again, but I have to share with you a message today. Jesus needs you to all be preachers. Yo, you're all going to get nervous now, aren't you? Yeah, you're all going to get nervous. Maybe not all of you have the, have the actual call to lead a church, but we are all called to share the good news of Jesus Christ, that he's alive and he's living in our world today. Amen? Amen. We're going to be just fine today. We are blessed to have some really wonderful people with us today. Pastor Janice Locke is with us from St. John's, of course, and she's going to tell her call story on how Jesus is always waiting to find use for us in our lives, no matter how long we wait. And Pastor Randy Lee is from the London Azalea Church, and he is in the middle of his call right now. He's experiencing it right this moment as he takes on these two churches. I just can't wait to hear when his time comes. I want to hear what his Jesus experience is doing to him and his family. So, so why does a guy who's been a registered nurse for 40 years decide to become a preacher? Isn't it time to play golf? Isn't it time to play with my grandkids? Isn't it time to just kick back and bask in my success? <laughs> Good question. You're wondering too. Yeah, me too. Now, I promised Pastor Brad this would be five minutes, five minutes top, so I got to get started. Near impossible, but here we go. Yeah, thank you. Three conditions. Three conditions caused this thing to happen. First one was hospice. Hospice. I was a hospice nurse. I case managed lots and lots of people. And who do you think you work with in every single day in hospice? Jesus. Oh, my God, every single day. I can't, you can't possibly imagine as you work with these people. I, Jesus and I helped 300 individuals while I was in hospice nursing to go to their victory in Jesus. Wow, I got to be the concierge to the afterlife. Anyway, but not just... <laughs> Not just with Christians, not just with Christians, but I got to do this with Jews and Muslims and Eastern religions, and there was this one Wiccan witch, and please don't ask me any more about that one. <laughs> but, there were, but there were only just a few people who had no place to go, just a very few, and sad beyond sad. Now, for us Christians, oh my goodness, we get the best deal. I believe Jesus gives you and me more chances than you can possibly imagine. And I believe just as you're thinking about passing and dying and you're going to ignore Jesus, he says to you this, don't you want to be with me in eternal peace in heaven? I've always loved you and I love you now. What do you say? Amen. That's the word you should be saying. And I hope this offer is one that no one can refuse. Now, the second condition, it's critical. I belong to a church. Yeah, I belong to a church that encouraged me to try. By sharing the words, I got to be liturgist, I got to do different things. I was given the opportunity to see if I could give an effective message or not. And blessings to this very day to a number of us, for Reverend, for Reverend Evans Bentley, who gave us all a chance. The people at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Monroe was where it turned out a lot of pastors. In 12 years, they turned out six pastors. They were all youth leaders, so beware if you're a youth leader. You know where your history is going to go. It's, I'm telling you, it's just all part of it. So I'm minding my own business. I'm nearing retirement when Jesus just starts popping into my head with thoughts and offer of, I've got a deal of your lifetime. You've got a deal of my lifetime. He says, preach for me. And I said, me? I'm sorry, <clears throat> me? <laughs> what do I know about being a preacher? My goodness. Well, wait, this involves influential public speaking every week. What have I got myself into? So much for the quiet retirement. What are you doing to me, Jesus? Thank you. Looking at the needs of a spiritual community is what the district superintendent had in mind when he called me to shepherd a church. When I asked him, what am I supposed to do with these people? And he said, just love them, just love them. Best advice ever, best advice ever. The United Methodist Church has provided a wonderful local pastor program that I am currently in. Well, it's kind of like the National Guard version of being a pastor. I learn while I'm growing and, and working in the church. I'm taking seminary classes now. 
I'm going back to college after 20 years away. College has really changed since the 1970s. <laughs> wow, has it really changed. Now, I'd heard that God saves some of the best parts of life for last. I'm blessed to have a reason to get up each and every day and the need to share God's love as I have received it from him. It continues to be a daily decision to pick up that cross and help others carry theirs. Oh, it's just the best. It's a fun, challenging, and the most important word is worthwhile life. Now there's that third condition. And this one is quite, quite important. For my wife Connie understood that this was a real calling and not just a whim. Not just something that Willie wanted to do, but a real calling. And that, I tell you, she's, she's our communion steward at the church. She shares my dream with me. Thank you, honey. I appreciate that more than you know. That pretty much sums it up. I've been captured by Jesus in so many ways. I, I've been accused of having too much enthusiasm. Can you imagine that? <laughs> too much enthusiasm. Easy, easy. But I've got two other people. I really have got to hear their stories. We're all in the process of either, be, either being a pastor or newly added or, or seeking their calling as they sit there. I'm looking at, oh, he's feeling the thoughts now. <laughs> but it's my pleasure at this time to introduce to you Pan Pastor Janice Locke of St. John's Lutheran. My friend, what's gotten into you? From, from tall to short here. Um, and actually, my story is going to sound an awful lot like Pastor Willie's did. Um, but I wanted to start by saying, God calls each one of us to a vocation through which we interact with the world around us. And through those various callings, whether it's to be a spouse, a parent, a grandparent, a nurse, a worker, a writer, whatever your calling might be, we are all so serving God by caring for our neighbors. But what I'm here to talk about is how that call from God changes over time. We learn and we grow in our faith, and as that happens, God's direction in our lives can change, often taking us down a very unexpected path. And that's really what I want to talk with you about today, is how the path was really winding for me. I was originally called to the service of others when I was about five years old. Now, granted, I think it was because I saw a picture of my older cousin in a nice starched white nursing uniform with a white cap on, and I saw that picture when I was about five, and I said, that's what I want to be. And I imagined myself caring for patients, wearing that starched white uniform and that beautiful white cap. Well, by the time I graduated from college, we didn't wear white nursing, home, white nursing uniforms anymore. Everybody was wearing scrubs, and nobody wore a cap, because those were the dirtiest things in the hospital. <laughs> but that was my dream, and I lived it out. I went to Michigan State University and got a bachelor's degree in nursing, and I started my nursing career as a registered nurse at Providence Hospital in Southfield. I loved it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the direct patient care. I taught others about nursing. But I began feeling, after about nine or 10 years, mm, there's an urge to do something else, something more. So I figured God was saying, expand your nursing education. Be, be more in the nursing field. OK, I had invested a lot of time and energy and money into being a nurse, so I thought, well, that must be the direction I'm supposed to go. So I enrolled in a master's degree program at the University of Michigan, and I studied to become a gerontological nurse practitioner. And I graduated with that master's degree from U of M, and I began to work as a nurse practitioner. Now, just to let you know, just because I went to both Michigan State and uh, U of M, <laughs> My blood runs green and white, and it always will. <laughs> 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 
And I enjoyed being a nurse practitioner. But I had this sense that I still wasn't quite on the path God had for me. But I'll be honest with you, I couldn't fathom putting all of those years of education and experience away. I thought, you know, I, I can't. So I worked as a nurse practitioner for the next 29 years. But still feeling that pull from God all along the way. And as I began to sort of explore that, I discovered that our synod of the Lutheran Church here in Detroit has a program called the Licensed Lay Ministry Academy. And it's a two-year course of study where you take a series of classes and then you do a one-year internship on top of that under the supervision of a pastor to hone your skills. I thought, okay, here we go. I can do that part-time while I still work as a nurse practitioner. Everybody's happy, including God, I think. Well, I loved it. I did the licensed lay ministry, and I loved it. And I became a licensed lay minister, and I began being assisting at the church where I was um, a member in Farmington Hills. I thought, this is going to answer that nudge that God has been poking me with all this time. But it didn't. And this is where I talk about the perfect storm kind of as a joke, but it, it sort of was a series of events that came together that really made me listen to God more clearly. I was, had been working as a nursing, or excuse me, as a, a nurse practitioner, and then on the side, for about two years, I'd been a licensed lay minister serving at my church. Well, the first item in this perfect storm was that I began to get dissatisfied with my career in healthcare. I thought, I just am not doing what I feel is my strength. My strength has always been establishing relationships with people, getting to know people. And as time was passing, healthcare was changing, and I was getting pushed to see more patients a day and generate more revenue. And it was all about that, and I couldn't spend the time I needed to get to know patients and their families. So I began looking around for another job. And my best friend said to me, who is also a nurse, said, well, Jance, if you could have any dream job, what would it be? And I said, well, actually, I'd like to be a pastor, but I don't have the education for that. So I kind of shelved that, shelved that idea, and it was there. I began counting down, not the days, not the weeks, not the months, but the years until I could retire. But I had a lot of joy when I was working as a licensed lay minister in my church. The next thing that happened was right around that time, the pastor of my home congregation took a call to serve as assistant to the bishop. And there was going to be about a three-month period of time where my home church was going to be without a pastor because they were going to get an interim in, but he wasn't available. So they said, would you mind filling in, running the services, preaching the sermons? So I said, okay, I'll do it. And I did, and I enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, I loved it. At one point, of course, I was still working 60 hours a week in my nurse practitioner job. And then on top of that, an additional probably 15 or so as filling in as the pastor for the church, the synod called and said, do we need to take this, this church thing off your plate? You sound like you're really too busy. I said, oh, please, no, that's where I get joy in life. Now, if you could find somebody to do the nurse practitioner job for me, that would be great. <laughs> well, of course, that wasn't the answer. The third event in this little perfect storm of mine was that the synod invited a representative from United Lutheran Seminary to come and visit with those of us in this area that were interested in ministry. And believe me, there were a wide range of ages of people that attended this little informal gathering. I was among one of the older. And um, I found out at that meeting that, number one, there was a possibility of getting a full scholarship to seminary. I thought, wow, $18,000 a year, I'll, I'll jump on that. And they had a program called an accelerated co-op program wherein I could do my internship while I was studying meaning I could finish my seminary education in three years instead of the usual four. 
And I thought, again, at my age, I might as well get going as soon as I can. Then I got the scholarship. So tuition was covered. So there was nothing standing in my way. Well, other than the minor expense of buying my own health insurance for three years. But, um, but it was clear. I remember driving home from that meeting, saying to the other, my friends in the car with me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to quit nursing, and I'm going to go to seminary. And I did. And it was a wonderful experience. I graduated from the seminary just this last May. I'd been working here in Dundee in my internship at St. John for the last three years. A wonderful, wonderful con congregation that welcomed me with open arms. And I feel at home there. They're my people, and I love being a part of that congregation. I got the feeling, particularly on graduation day this past May, God saying to me, finally, you got it. I've been pushing you for all these years. You finally listened. And I feel like I'm doing what God wants me to do. I always followed God's call in my life, from the time I was five and wanted to be a nurse in that uniform and cap, to this moment when I get to wear my collar proudly and when I get to speak in front of groups like this. God, goes, God has, has guided me every step of the way, and I believe that he guides each one of us. It took me a while to get the message, but when I got it, I got it. And I'm happy to say that I'm here today because I listened. Each one of you listened to the message that God is giving you, and listen for the change as it might change over time. Amen. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Pastor Randy. I have a confession to make. I'm just Randy. <laughs> These are the pastors back here. You got the job, buddy. You know, uh, I was born into the church, literally. Uh, you know, I was baptized in a Methodist church. I went to the church that my parents were married in. I remember my dad would hold the hymnal lower so that I could read it. You know, he would always mark out the different pages. And I remember thinking, oh, five verses? Why didn't they take the two verse hymn? <laughs> and I grew up in the church, and I ended up getting married in the same church my parents got married in. And then I walked away. And there are a lot of reasons, but most of it boiled down to uh, I was a self-indulged jerk. You know, I was full of myself, and I knew everything, and nobody else knew anything, and, well, I didn't need church, and I'd rather watch football on Sunday. And I want to tell you about the amazing story of, of what happened that turned that around for me. But I don't have one. There was no burning bush, no tablets coming down from the mountaintop. It was just this nagging feeling that I had that there was more to life than this. That even though I had a beautiful wife and a career and a Trans Am that I really loved, <laughs> that there was more. That we are more than just these biological bodies that we're in. That love is more than just DNA, that it was true meeting of the souls. It was a feeling that something in this world is not right and that I should do something about it. But I didn't know what to do. I mean, we, we put uh, all our plastics in the blue bin and that seemed pretty good. And, you know, I. I tried to drive an economical car. I even had a stick shift that was fun. Uh, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't what brought me joy. It wasn't what made me feel complete. It wasn't the things that made my life make sense. We started attending church again, a little church in, in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. In fact, it wasn't even a church yet, because we didn't have 100 members. We were a, a fellowship, and we were working to get 100 members. 
and I just remember how wonderful it felt. We'd have to come in, and we, we were in this auditorium of the high school, and every time everybody stood up for the hymns, uh, the chairs would flap up, and they'd make that sound. And, and we'd have fellowship, and we'd have people over our houses, because there weren't many of us, and, and we'd, we'd talk, and we'd, we'd talk about our faith, and we'd talk about how we could make our church better, and more importantly, how we could make our community better. And we started doing things in the community. We would go out and we'd pick up a litter. And we would go out and we would feed people. And we started a program where people could get a meal or clothing if they needed it. And that felt right. That felt different from anything else I was seeing in the world. Because when I look at the world, I see greed and I see avarice and I see anger and I see division. But here... We're people just helping people. And I believe in my heart that most people just want to help each other. That we just want to get along. We want our neighbors to succeed. We want people to be happy. And I think you feel that too. I think you feel that there's something wrong with this world. That there's more to life than watching Netflix or listening to the news with the latest person barking at you about how awful things are. There's more to this world than the anger and the division. There's more to this world than the vile. There's more than Twitter and TikTok. But there's life. And life is what we are called to. We are called to a higher calling. And I know you feel that. I know that it's out there. Raise your hand if you feel that there's something wrong with this world. Raise your hand if you feel that something needs to be done. And you're called on to do it, just as I was. And some people, they have wonderful, fantastic stories. And some people are like me that have the most boring stories ever made. But it doesn't matter. Because God has chosen you. When you see something wrong with this world, that's what God has chosen you to do. I believe in you. And I'm sorry that I don't have some great story to tell you. But I know the Spirit's here, and I know it's in you, and I know that we can go out and make this world a heaven on earth. Amen. Dear friends, there's a point to our message here today. Remember I started off by saying that Jesus needs you? So we've had three call stories. They're stories that could be any one of us. Who's feeling that maybe somebody's nudging you? Who's in your mind with a little poker stick saying you can do something more? Who hears in their mind these words, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? And if you like those lords, stand and rise. We're going to sing that song right now. Let's sing, Here I Am, Lord.
Now we come to the time when we explain the water. I know you've all been looking at it thinking, I'm so thirsty. <laughs> if only just a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I bet you if all of us pastors got up here today and told our stories, there would be a lot of uh, similarities there. And, uh, you know, uh, quite a few of us our uh, second career pastors, including myself and probably a few others. <laughs> but, uh, you know, most of us went into ministry when we were <clears throat> older. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes it takes a lifetime before we actually start to listen to God. And uh, we finally say, okay, I get it now. You've been nudging, you've been pushing, you've been uh, maybe threatening to push me off the cliff. <laughs> but, you know, it, when we go into that ministry, we discover that that's the best place we've ever been. And uh, it's a wonderful feeling to feel. Today, uh, we are going to celebrate uh, another tradition outside of the traditions that we're used to, um, and it's called the Moravian Love Feast. We've done it a few times at our church here in Dundee, and um, it's different than communion, but in the same way, it's a remembrance of what Jesus did for us, and especially for his disciples as they gathered day after day after day and heard the Jesus words and teachings to lead them in the place that they would be going one day once he was gone. And so today we come, I'm gonna ask a couple of my youth here, they didn't know about this yet, but we have a couple baskets of crackers and I would like them to pass them out to you to go along with your water. And uh, we will celebrate this uh, love feast, or what some call an agape meal, as we remember what Jesus has done for us as well. We remember those stories that we read and hear over and over in the Bible of Jesus teaching his disciples, but it's also teaching us to live our lives to the best that we can be to live it in a way that God created us to be, to live it in a way that we can love our neighbor as ourself. So will a couple of our youth come forward <clears throat> and you can go around and hand out uh, crackers to everybody. The reason that this is a little bit different than communion, just grab some of the packages. The reason this is a little bit different than communion, our group here comes from different faith traditions, and sometimes the communions mean different things to different faith traditions. And so, as a love feast, John Wesley, who is the founder of the United Methodist Church, uh, found out about this Moravian love feast um, I think by accident in a way, but he saw a lot of meaning in it for our lives that we can come together even if we don't all believe in the same way and do 
our theology in the same way, to live our lives in the same way, we can all participate together as one in the same way and experience our God. So as they pass these uh, crackers out to everybody, let us take a moment to pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for this pleasure of gathering together here for this occasion today. We give you thanks now for this love feast or this agape meal that we partake of that reminds us of the many meals that you had shared with your disciples throughout his ministry. And help us to draw closer to you and closer to one another. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I will read a couple of scriptures today from the Gospels. The first is from Luke, chapter 9, verses 12 through 17. It says, late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowds away so that they can go and surround the villages in the countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place. Well, you know, I think in a way you could probably say that we're in a remote place because we're not in our own churches today. And Jesus replied, you give them something to eat. And they answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. And unless we go and buy food for all the crowds. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And I don't count 50 around each table, but it's close. <laughs> and so everybody sat down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. And then he gave them to his disciples to distribute out to the people. And they all ate. And they were satisfied. And the disciples picked up the 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And then we move to John, chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 25 through 35. Excuse me, 35. <clears throat> when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus asked them, or answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate of those loaves and you were full. Do not work for the food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. <clears throat> Which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, what was, must we do to do the work of, that God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who has sent me. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? And our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from the heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it's not Moses who gave you that bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. Sir, they said, give us this bread. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. These are the words of God. Thanks be to God. You know, we come together in this place. God has provided us with these crackers, the bread. He's provided us with the water, the living water that he brings to each and every one of our lives. So now you can take part in your crackers. 
I want you to wait because it sounds like uh, it's pouring down rain or something as you're all opening all these crackers. <laughs> and drink your water. And let us share in those memories that Jesus taught us in his message in the scriptures today. It's important because we all need life. And Jesus' life is eternal. And it is eternal for us as well. I hope you enjoy your crackers. They didn't give me any. <laughs> That's okay. Here, my friend, you can't go without a cracker. Oh, thank you. You are welcome. Mm. That's okay. You're probably allergic to peanuts. <laughs> this is just an appetizer for the real meal after we're done. I should know better than to eat a cracker when I'm trying to speak. <laughs> well, let us uh, take a moment to pray. And I'm going to ask you to join me in the Lord's Prayer today as we uh, praise God with the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we go from this place today, as we do every week out of our churches, let us remember that we are going into a place that we continue our worship. We go out from the walls here to spend time in our communities with our families, our friends, our co-workers, and people we have never met yet, those friends that we have yet to come. Remember those people. Worship with them. Tell your stories. Share your life um, faith. We all have a story. It's just a matter of whether we're willing to tell it. And you heard three pastors today. I know at one point in their careers, probably they were afraid to tell their story. And not to say that this is what's going to happen to you, become a pastor, but when you tell your story, you can change lives. Remember, Jesus sent his disciples out into the world to go make disciples of Jesus Christ so that it might transform the world for his kingdom. And that's what all of us are called to do, to tell that story. Amen. Now uh, Tommy's going to come up, and he's going to lead us in uh, a, a familiar song, especially any of you who went to church camp, pass it on, or went to church back in the 70s, either place. Uh, so uh, let's stand if you're able and let's sing together, pass it on. Only takes a
as we go from here today, I want you all to know that you're all invited to join us for our meal today. We have a potluck dinner. It'll be off to the left in the hallway. All are invited, even if you didn't bring one. If you didn't bring a, a plates or silverware or cups, we have those too. We're looking out for all of you because we want to share in this food together, in the fellowship that we will have together as one today. This has been a great experience to bring churches together, to bring Christ's bigger church together into a, a place like this. And like I said, this won't be the last time. And if you have some good criticism, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll take a little bad if we <laughs> to, so we might learn. But uh, we are excited to have you all here. So join me in our blessing. Lord God, we have gathered here this morning together as one church, your church, so that we could worship and praise you. We come from different locations, different denominations, and different theological backgrounds, and yet we still worship one God, the same God, our creator and our sustainer. Help us to stand tall and walk in Christ's peace, to speak up and tell of God's goodness, and to touch and heal with the Spirit's love today and always. Lord, you are a God that attends to our every need. Just as you have blessed us this morning with spiritual nourishment, we now ask your blessing upon us as we join, join together in this potluck dinner with food that we will be partaking of in this time of fellowship and community with one another. And we give you thanks. Amen. So you may... Find your way towards the food, and Tommy will uh, play as we move that direction. Every time I try, I make it all right. You're welcome.